Good morning. Hey, I like hearing everybody. It's good to be together. Uh, for all you gentlemen out there, happy Father's Day. Uh, for those of you who are fathers, it's, um, yeah, one of my favorite verses, uh, kind of a life verse for me is 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14. And it, it says, be strong, uh, act like men. Stand firm in your faith, right? Be strong. And, and we get this kind of... Uh, unfortunately, uh, kind of this, like, well, guys have to be macho, act like a man, right? And yet the next verse says this uh, to all that, uh, those men, do everything in love, as love is our guiding factor. And so I'm grateful for you gentlemen, fathers and father figures this morning. Um, we're grateful for you. But I want to turn our attention this morning to our Heavenly Father, because uh, us earthly fathers are not perfect. We make mistakes, but our Heavenly Father never disappoints us. And so as we gather this morning, um, we're reminded of his perfect love for us. And it's Christ's love in us, so it can be Christ's love through us this morning. Amen? Would you stand as we begin in, uh, our worship this morning?
spoke your name into the night and through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ church. I'm so happy to see you all here this morning. Hey, if you have a Bible with you or a smartphone or a tablet that has your Bible, open up to Psalm 63.4 for me real quick. I'll put the words on the screen. It says, I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. And then again, farther along in the Psalms, the Psalms 132, 134 verse 2 David says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. And he's talking about worship, right? Why, why, does, why do we see people in church on this platform in our congregation 
raising our hands to worship. And the simple, I think the best way that I can explain that is it is an outward reflection of, of an inward posture, a feeling of surrender, of amazement, of wonder. And that's why we do that. That's why we lift our hands so we can show Jesus how much he means to us and reflect what he's done for us in our lives. This is an outward reflection of how he's changed us on the inside. So please, this next song, as you feel led, if you're willing, if you're able, lift up your hands and worship and just praise Jesus with all that you've got. Thank you.
when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We are just so grateful that you are the God who does so much more than we could ever, ever imagine, Father. Um, we just thank you for this morning. We pray that this be a time of continued worship as we delve into your word this morning, Father. And all of God's children said, amen. Well, good morning, church. Um, at this time, uh, we're going to just take a moment and release our children before we get started with our message. So if our children could take a stand for just a moment, if there are any children, I think. There we go. We do have children today. Wonderful. All right. If we can just extend a hand and we're going to go ahead and bless them. So children of Monta Vista Chapel, may you know that your heavenly father loves you. May you know that in Jesus, you have been accepted into God's family. May you set your hearts on things from above, the things that matter most to God. Love, forgiveness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and kindness. God has chosen you and calls you his child. As you go, may you be rooted in his redeeming love. Well, good morning. I just want to take a moment and just thank um, so many of you that came out to our Barnyard Boutique yesterday and supported uh, women's ministry. So just thank you so much. That was such a wonderful time. And um, I was just sharing with people this morning that it was just so much more than a fundraiser. It was just a beautiful time of connecting with one another. Um, so many people from our church got to meet people from our church. <laughs> and that's what's beautiful about getting together outside of worship services is we get to have those opportunities to connect. Uh, so just thank you again for your support. Um, yeah, as we continue this morning, we are going through a series uh, called Wise Guys where we're looking at the minor prophets in the Old Testament. And while each one of these minor prophets offers us wisdom to live by, today we're going to be peeling back some layers of a few more uh, ideas on wisdom. Uh, we're actually going to look at a prophet who talks specifically about wisdom. Um, and this idea of us being hyper-focused um, on the things that distract us and maybe distract us from what is most important in our lives. And so I'm just going to share a quick story about a little bit of my experience with receiving some wisdom. I remember when I was transitioning uh, from a teenager to a young adult. Now, um, 
For some of us, that might seem like eons ago, but if you could, like, let's go back there together. Um, for some of you, this is what you're doing now. Um, you're making that transition. And I found myself trying to answer the question, what am I going to do with my life? What am I doing with my life? And at this time in my God story, I was fairly unformed in how I was following God. I was a faithful follower, but I was still unaware of how God was present in the various areas of my life and my circumstances. There wasn't really anything that I was drawn to as far as subject matter, so selecting a course to study um, in college was kind of daunting for me. And the subject matter that occupied like my talk space when I was with friends and family was usually revolving around God's love. And I was really involved with my church and my local youth group. And so I thought, well, I'll just be a youth pastor. And um, as I started having conversations with the people of influence in my life, I was encouraged at that time to bypass the ministry degree and uh, come back to it after getting a BA in anything other than ministry um, if God was still leading me in that direction. And there were a couple people who even reminded me, well, hey, Kels, you're, you're a woman, and it's hard to find ministry jobs, you know, being a female. And by no means were they trying to deter me, but they were just holding a reality in front of me. Um, and I tend to be someone who just really values that straightforward communication. And so I trusted this wisdom that was put in my life. And soon enough, I decided to go to school, and um, I chose directing theater for my bachelor's degree. Um, and I knew I'd be working in college, and so I thought, well, there's no way I could fail theater. And so I was in my first year of studying theater, and I was supposed to take a math course. I, I'm not a math person at all. I'm terrible with numbers. Um, it was actually a remedial course I was supposed to take, and it was full. And um, I got put into a different class, and it was business statistics. And I thought, huh, okay then. Um, and surprisingly, statistics made sense to me. So I did really well in that class. Um, and then in my third year, I had to wait for a class that wasn't being offered till the following year. And so I ended up picking up a degree in public speaking communications in that year. Um, and so uh, while this was all taking place, I had been working at Starbucks right here on Gear Road. So in fact, I met a lot of you guys through my line and I probably could tell you your order um, to this day. And I kid you not, there was not a day that went by that I would think about my someday. Someday I will do something with my life. Someday. Um, yeah, and when Nate and I were in our early years of marriage, I remember sitting with a couple from our church and uh, sitting down with them in their living room and talking through my insecurities, um, my circumstances, all of these ideas about my someday. And I was listening, uh, listing out all of these insufficiencies of why I just can't do anything great with my life. I wasn't educated enough. I wasn't smart enough. I had wasted time in theater school. I should have, but, dot, dot, dot. And I remember the man who was sitting with us looking me straight in the eye, and he was just a very respectable, successful man who I respected. Um, and he looked me in the eye and he said, Kelsey, you have everything that you need to follow God. You have everything you need to be the person who God has called you to be. You need nothing. And when that's like when I was introduced to this idea of an ugly cry. It had just wrecked me. It was such a profound statement that was spoken into my life as I wrestled with this ongoing swirl of what am I going to do with my life? And while I didn't fully understand what this man's comment meant for a few more years, I was reminded every time that I came home from a rough day because my husband would say, Kelsey, you have everything that you need to be the person that God has called you to be. And this couple's, their words would circulate in my mind every single time I'd end up in this place. And they shared with me so much more than just those words. They shared their wisdom. So though I fully couldn't grasp it then, I can surely say that there have been faithful servants like this couple in my life who have walked beside me through various seasons. They were there when I was young, offering me guidance. They were there when I had life-changing decisions to make. And they were there to speak truth in love 
when I lost sight of what was most important, when I got distracted by the things that I thought my life should be, um, and rather than the life that God had called me to. There were guides in my life who helped me reorient myself from my someday to my today. And they were the people who would challenge me to focus on who I am becoming rather than what will I do or what am I doing. These individuals were essentially what some people would refer to as a cloud of witnesses. Each person in my cloud, so to speak, shared something valuable with me over the years. They shared their wisdom and their experience. And though it took time for me to fully understand and embrace such wisdom, each person along my journey was patient with me and generous with sharing the wisdom that they had received from their own God story. And so the author of Hebrews in this concept, uh, he introduces this concept of a cloud of witnesses. In Hebrews 12.1 it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that is so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And this is a familiar verse to us. And I think that we've trained ourselves to the later part of this verse and we've forgotten the first part. You see, we get fixated on running that great race, but we forget that in order to run that race, we actually need a cloud of witnesses spurring us on, people who help us along the way, who guide us. And so as we continue our message this morning, I really want to encourage you guys to be thinking about who is in your own cloud of witnesses, and whose cloud are you a participant in? I'm going to come back to my story in a bit, but for now, if we could just kind of take that question and we're going to put it in our pocket, and we're going to come back to it in a bit. And so we're going to direct our attention now to discovering how biblical wisdom is observed throughout the scripture by taking a deeper look at the prophet uh, Haggai. Uh, some people pronounce it Haggai. I'm going to pronounce it Haggai because I get tongue-tied, so it's Haggai today. If you want to call him Haggai, that's fine. Uh, but today it's Haggai. Uh, so first, let's look at the biblical definition of wisdom. Wisdom is the application of God's will and ways in our life. Wisdom is the application of God's will and his ways in our life. And it's often a foreign concept to our human nature. In essence, it's seeing and responding to life from God's perspective. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to people, but in the end it leads to death. And so we know uh, that the opposite of wisdom is what? Foolishness, right? It's foolishness. It's dismissing God's way and his will in our lives. And unfortunately, remaining a fool requires much less effort than the pursuit of wisdom. And so let's hold these definitions of wisdom close to us and to our hearts this morning as we delve into what was going on in Haggai's time. And by the way, this could be found in the book of Haggai. It's a very short book. In my Bible, it's like a front and a back page. Um, and so most of us are familiar with the story of the Israelites in the Old Testament. Uh, they were God's chosen people. They were called to be holy, which means called to be set apart, to behave differently than the rest of the world, right? And God had made covenants with his people. And while he kept his end of the covenant, the Israelites failed to keep theirs over and over and over again. While they would have these moments of clarity and reorient their hearts towards God, they, would, they were also a highly, highly distracted people something I think that we can probably relate to today. What is distracting us this morning? Is there something that's distracting you? I could list off 10 things that had my attention this morning. They would lose sight of God's wisdom in their lives and they began to oscillate between the pursuit of his ways and his wisdom to falling into ways of foolishness. So in today's message, we're looking at a generation of people in scripture who have ridden this behavioral and spiritual wave for generations and generations and generations. And so about 400 years after Solomon's reign, Haggai, one of the minor prophets, finds himself standing in the wreckage of Jerusalem when God prompts him to deliver a message to the people. Now the people wandering back into the city of Jerusalem are those who have been roaming the desert um, as they traveled from Babylon back to Jerusalem. You see, the Israelites uh, had come to the promised land under Joshua's leadership and enjoyed seasons of prosperity. And eventually, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, decided to exile the Israelites 
and send them out to Babylon, uh, Babylon, making them Babylonian refugees. And so with this backdrop, it would be appropriate to assume that those in attendance at Haggai's message and his teachings were probably young, young families. Because Nebuchadnezzar had forced their, their grandparents to go back to Babylon, and it wasn't until uh, Cyrus came into power uh, that the Babylonians with Jewish lineage were released and freed to leave Babylon so that they could return to their homeland. And it was about a 70-year span between the two different powers, and so as you can imagine, the trek to Jerusalem was a bit of a fantasy, right? They had this idea of what this promised land, what this homeland was going to look like. They have stories. They have stories from their grandparents and their great-grandparents telling them about this beautiful place. And so this new generation of young people only had that. They only had stories of the homeland, and they had dreamt of what it would look like to step on this beautiful land that they've heard of. And when they get there, they end up having to take in all the rubble and the wreckage and the pains of the past. I'm sure, I'm sure that they were disappointed because all that they had imagined and anticipated, all these things, all these ideas they had of home were wrecked. And so I know I love planning vacations. My husband loves going on vacations, but I like to plan them. It's the planning of the vacation um, and the anticipation that really gets me excited. Um, and our family had the opportunity last February to go to Legoland because that was um, our Christmas gift to our children. And so I kid you not, there was not a day from Christmas to February 17th that my kids did not ask me questions about Legoland. Mom, what's it going to be like? What are the rides? What's my room going to look like? I mean, we were on Google every day, Legoland, you know, look at pictures. Um, and I'm, they're so excited and they're anticipating it, and I am too because I'm like a big kid, especially when it comes to Legos. Um, and we were just so excited to go. Now, imagine that our family had built up all this anticipation only to get there and find that all of Legoland had been bulldozed to the ground. Well... It's kind of what it was like for God's people to enter back into the promised land, only this wasn't a vacation. This was supposed to be home. It's some home, right? And so obviously, after such a long trip, the people would want to settle in and build their homes. However, God had instructed them to first build the temple. So the people begin to build the temple, and soon enough, they get distracted, and they get preoccupied building their own homes. And the temple project gets placed on the back burner and forgotten. They had laid the foundation of the temple, and then they let it sit for about 16 to 17-ish years. And the people said, well, it's just not time to build God's house. Well, how do they know that? God didn't say that. They didn't know it. Yet in their many distractions, they had always found a reason to not do the thing that God had asked them to do. I think we can relate to this. I mean, how many times have we put off that thing that God has asked us to do? That phone call that he's nudging us to make, that text message, that apology that we're compelled to give, that act of generosity that he prompts in our hearts, that time it takes to spend with someone that we love, to rub shoulders with them. How many times have we put off that thing that God has asked us to do? We're busy and we're distracted just like the Israelites were. Their circumstances seem to compromise their faithfulness. Do our circumstances compromise our faithfulness? I would have but. There is this reality settling out the people of Israel that is informing them that they need to take care of what's, what's most important to them. They need to get everything off their list first before they can get to God's list. And if you're anything like me, that list is long and it grows. It's never ending. Just ask my husband. And if my list, if I can't get through it, I can make a list for every one of you. I'm really good at making lists for people. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're working off their own list. They have this idea of their someday and they're working towards their someday and they're not living in the God-given today the today that God has placed right in front of them. Yet, God's will is not something that wavers based on our circumstances. Just think for a moment of a time in your life when God called you to do something difficult. 
when the time gets tough, we don't just say, hey, God, hey, this isn't fun anymore, so see you later. Um, I guess in our culture, that seems to be the thing to do. Um, but hear me when I say that that is not the model that Christ gives us in the life that he lived. No, we persevere knowing that God um, has given us everything that we need. That he will, that his will for our lives doesn't dissolve just because our circumstances are uncomfortable or challenging. His will does not waver. I also want to note here that God's will doesn't mean that everything falls into place. Sometimes it does, and that's such a blessing. But it does not always just fall into place perfectly without struggle and trial. Sometimes his will comes with obstacles depending on our circumstances. Sometimes it gets messy. Sometimes it requires us to lean into our discomfort and hard circumstances or that of another so that we could be the hands and feet of Jesus. And so here we have Haggai who brings this message of wisdom in relation to the will of God to the people. And he doesn't necessarily tread lightly when it comes to pointing out what he sees and what must be done to get back on the trajectory to being faithful to God to build the temple like God had instructed them to do because this was the will of the Lord. He's consistent with stating in each message, he prefixes it with, give careful thought to your ways. And some translations say, consider your ways. In the first two chapters alone, he says it five times. Now the word way in this statement merges two definitions. The word way is used for both character and action. Okay, so think manner and path, the manner in which we take a path. And so it's a statement probing the people to not only consider what they do, but consider who they are as they do this. It's like asking, consider your character. Consider how you go about your life. And for those who are like me who like to follow along, we're gonna, just going to read that section there um, in chapter 1, Haggai chapter 1 verse 3 through 9, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. Uh, Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while the house of God remains in ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thoughts to your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring down down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You You expected much, but you see it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord? Because my house, which remains in ruin, while each of you are building your own house. And so Haggai first accuses the people of misplaced priorities. They're building their own houses instead of building God's house. This is a rebellion against the covenant in which they had made with God. They had chosen to not apply his will to their life. They had chosen foolishness. And then he challenges them. He says, Uh, that the morale is low. And Haggai reminds them of the prophetic promise of the new Jerusalem. Now, I think this is a reminder that we all need sometimes because we can lose sight of what God is inviting us into. We can lose sight because of our current circumstances. And we let that meddle in our faithfulness to God. And then he instructs them, telling them what must be done. He calls them to a covenant faithfulness. Uh, he uses a parable. He says, um, "If a person def- is defiled, if a def- I'm sorry, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled?" And a priest answers him and says, "Yes, it becomes defiled." Then Haggai said, "So is it with the people of this nation in my sight," declares the Lord. Whatever they do will be defiled. That's a little bit confusing, but I'm going to unravel that a bit. So this parable speaks to God's concern around our integrity and our character. God doesn't just desire his people to build his house. He desires his people to serve him joyfully and generously. And like Eric mentioned last week when he talked about Micah, to do that requires humility. 
We have to have humility as we do this. He didn't want them grumbling as they're laying the foundation of the temple or tossing in their scrap wood from their own projects. How we do what we do matters to God. Are we a people just dragging our feet in our service to God? Oh, I have to do another thing and enter in. What kind of offering are we giving the Lord as he calls us and invites us in to do something great in his will? There's a recent season of my life um, where God was calling me to drive three hours a day for a few weeks. And uh, it was really hard on my schedule and it was hard on my time because I wasn't getting a lot of face time with my children. Um, and my body had just ached from sitting in my car. I usually tend to love to drive, but I does not enjoy this drive. And the first week, I was grumbling in the car. I just was kind of in a bad mood. And then the second week, um, I chose to talk to God and have some words with him about my frustration with the circumstances and situation. You know, let him know my side of the story. And then that third week, I decided to invite Jesus into the car with me. And let me just say, I much preferred that third week because God was able to do so much more in my circumstances when I welcomed him to be with me and I stopped grumbling about it. God is just asking us to invite him into the car with us sometimes. Haggai then goes on to remind them of the future hope of God's kingdom. Uh, God will confront and defeat. God will fulfill his promise of a king through the line of David. Haggai doesn't want the people to lose sight of the bigger picture here. The greater promise that God has in store for his people. And so Haggai is left wondering if this generation will be faithful to God. He makes the point that our choices matter to God. Our faithfulness matters. Haggai's wise message motivates humility and calls God's people to take action. It leaves us wondering if our generation is going to be faithful to God. And so while this seems like a simple example of a course correction, there's so much more that the Israelites can glean from this message, and frankly, so much more that I think we can glean too. There are reasons why the Israelites are distracted, and consequently, they are the same reasons why we get distracted too. Here's just a few. They had their own checklist that they thought was important to them. They were fearful that God um, that if they did God's stuff first, that they wouldn't have time for their stuff. There were things in their lives that sounded more appealing and more attractive to them than building God's temple. They wanted ownership of their own time. They wanted to be comfortable. They lacked the wisdom and humility to honor the will of God in all circumstances. They did not prioritize God's will in their lives, but rather they were in pursuit of their own desires and their own will. Haggai's message reminds us that wisdom is a choice and requires disciplined and delayed gratification. Proverbs 1.7 informs us that fools despise wisdom and discipline. Remember, the opposite of being wise is being foolish. And so wisdom and discipline, they're usually very closely tied together. Delayed gratification is something that most generations find incredibly unattractive. As consumers, we tend to want immediate results and accessibility. This is why we love Amazon so much, right? Because five-day shipping is just too long to wait for something that we want right now. It's inconvenient for us. Why plan for something if we want it now? Why think when we have resources that think for us on demand? There is wisdom in being disciplined in regards to the words that come out of our mouth. There's wisdom when we interact with others using self-control. There's wisdom in how we expend our resources, our time, our money, our energy. There's wisdom in surrounding ourselves with a cloud of witnesses to speak into our lives. I urge you, take that question. Ask yourself, who is in my cloud of witness? And whose cloud am I participating in? Most, of the uh, most things grow in value with time. This is the discipline part. 
perhaps the most obvious thing is finances, right? You put your money in a bank and it grows over time, hopefully. And education. Education is something that grows in value over time. No one goes to school for one week and becomes an expert in their subject matter. People spend years in education to gain greater insight into their careers, um, into the work that they do, their interest. In fact, regardless if you have a formal education or not, um, we are wired to continuously be learning new things. And for many of us, our life experience is our education. We are always digesting new information, right? It would be foolish for us to disregard all of the things that we've learned throughout our days on this earth. To say, oh, been there, oh, I'm gonna do that again. I know it was foolish the first time, but I'm gonna go back and do it again. When you've already learned the consequence of that, when you've already learned a better way, and oddly enough, there um, is wisdom in unlearning some things too, right? There are some things that just, even as a culture, we might want to just unlearn, um, which is an odd concept for so many of us. Relationships. Our relationships are something that we invest in, right? It takes time to get to know someone. It takes discipline in our schedule to make time to rub shoulders with someone, whether that be a spouse or a child or a parent, a friend, even coworkers. You know, taking time outside of work to get to know a coworker, great. It takes time. It's an investment. And what about our faith? Our faith is an investment. It takes discipline to invest in our faith. We want to look like Jesus, but it's hard work to become like him. We have a saying here at Monta Vista, to trust the slow work of God. It just doesn't happen overnight. It's a, it's a long journey. It takes time. So our faith is an investment. And so there is wisdom in having the discipline and delaying gratification. And the people of Haggai's day were so consumed and distracted by what they thought they needed, um, by what they wanted for themselves, that they lacked the discipline to wait for God's timing to fulfill their own desires. And the bottom line here um, is that we can absorb Haggai's teaching today uh, in a sense of that God gives us what we need. He resources us. Like my friend said, I'm going to take their words. Each of us has everything that we need to serve God. We have enough time. We have enough money. We have enough energy. We have enough emotional capacity. God's not telling us to do something today that he won't resource us with, right? Is there, is there a resource you feel like you need more of to serve God today? And will you trust that he will resource you with that thing? In him, we lack nothing. Scripture tells us that. And so I told you I'd come back to my story. Um, three years after sitting down with this couple in this couple's living room, uh, something clicked in my faith journey. I had realized that I had been incredibly busy in my pursuit of my someday and that I was missing out on my today. I had realized that every person that I talked to while serving coffee right there on Gear Road was God's will for me that day. I realized that God cared far more about the condition of my heart than he did about my educational or career path that I pursued. This didn't make it easier to follow God. It just made it a more authentic followership. <clears throat> and there were days that I still wrestled and uh, to believe that God had resourced me with everything that I needed to serve him. And truly, each day requires its own unique toolkit for us, right? Depending on, you know, who we are, what we need. All of our calls for each day are so different. Um, and it was 10 years after, that, after sitting in this couple's living room when I had applied for graduate school. And the admissions counselor called me and said, um, well, we're sorry to inform you, uh, but you'll need to take Math 1600 as a prerequisite to this program. And unfortunately, we don't offer that program, so you could take it elsewhere. You can come back and apply next year. And um, I asked, well, what, what is Math 1600? It's business statistics. Oh, do you mind looking at the top of my first page on my transcript? I think I might have that. Oh, yeah, it's there. Yeah, uh, perfect. Yeah, you took it in 2005. 
You see, God had given me everything I needed before I even knew that I needed it. That's just one example. That is a very simple, straightforward example, but I can't imagine how many things that we pick up from the Lord each day, these blessings that don't even have a name in our hearts that the Lord will use and resource you when it's time. I needed all of those people who spoke wisdom into my life along the way. I needed those people who challenged me to consider my character. Who am I becoming? Who am I being? Will I prioritize God's will over my own agenda? There were people who didn't try to fix my hard circumstances in life, but rather encouraged me to invite God into all circumstances in my life, to invite him into the car with me. And for me, applying wisdom in my own story has been to stop asking the question, what am I doing with my life or what will I do with my life, to lean into who am I becoming? Who am I being in this life? Am I being someone who loves like Jesus? Am I being the hands and feet of God? Am I being someone who is faithful to God's will in my life? We are a distracted people. And we need to be reminded of God's will in our lives. And that's okay. There's a lot of grace for that. That's why we have each other. That's why we have a church. Haggai's message is a message through the generations. It's through the ages. It's for all of us. It's an invitation for us to pause and truly consider our ways. What are we giving space to in our lives? What is occupying our attention? What is distracting us? from that thing that God is nudging us towards. Who are we being and who are we becoming? What resource do we think we need before we can follow God faithfully? And can we trust that he has already given us everything that we need to follow him today, to honor his will in our lives? May we truly consider our ways, church, as we go. Amen? Amen. Uh, Well, just a couple family business items before we conclude this morning. Um, There are chili uh, cook-off tickets in the courtyard. Uh, Our high school students are doing something really fun. There's a really fun trophy out there that you can win if you're uh, someone who enjoys making chili. Um, Also, next week we start one service at 10 a.m., and there's a giant wallapalooza out there on the field. Um, there's going to be water slides. I think there's going to be pastors and dunk tanks. I think you can actually uh, make donations and get people in the dunk tank. It's going to be awesome. If you would like to uh, sign up to bring something, I think like a salad or some sort of thing, Nancy is in the courtyard, um, and we can do that this morning. Uh, I think Nancy's there. Someone's there. Uh, so as we go this morning, would you just please stand for our benediction? So now to him who is able to do exceedingly more than we could ever ask or imagine, to him be the glory and honor forever and ever. And all God's children said, amen. Go in God's peace.